Welcome, in everybody, to our sixth edition of 62 Who Knew. We are here on WeBeamTV.com in Newport, Ritchie, Florida. And this is going to be an incredible episode. It's uh, one thing to have an expert on the show, uh, a national expert on long-term care, a national expert on this or that, uh, usually people I know, quite frankly. But what we're going to introduce you to tonight is just going to change the way you think about the world. So we're going to do a quick little synopsis for our first-time viewers. What is 62 Who Knew? Why are we bringing it to you? 62 Who Knew is really for that group of people, really around 55 to 65. I couldn't think of anything that rhymes real well with those numbers. Um, so we went with 62 Who Knew. But basically it is about the mixed blessing, the double-edged sword, if you would, of longer lifespans, how science and medical technology breakthroughs in the last two to three decades are just simply allowing us to live longer. In fact, the odds are if you make it to 65 in the United States of America, you have basically a 50% chance of making it to 90 and although today's guest is going to blow those numbers out of the sky, that is what the premise of 62 Who Knew is. Every week, we're going to bring on an expert to talk about things to increase the quality of life, because there's no reason to live that long if you don't have quality of life. We're going to bring on Social Security experts to talk about whether you should take Social Security at 62 or defer it till a later age. We're gonna bring, we already have brought on, long-term care insurance experts, life insurance experts, real estate experts. The list is really endless. In-home care people. Uh, the list just goes on and on because there's just no reason to live that long if in fact we can't do it with quality and style. And we are hoping, even though we're only in week six, but we are building a following that is already well into the thousands, and we want to thank you for that, that 62 Who Knew will be your source of information for just a plethora of quality items and products that you can constantly have access to. So we're not going to spend too much on this today because I'm so excited about our guest. Our guest, I have to read his memo. Usually uh, I, I memorize people's bios, but it's just too extensive, and I'm actually going to have to cut down on it a little. But our guest tonight is Mr. Richard Enslein, who is the executive director of the Florida region of the Weissman Institute of Science in Israel. And again, most of you have never heard of this, but after this hour show, I promise you, you'll be talking about it for a long, long time. But just a little bit about our guest background. He travels extensively and has been a guest speaker in numerous venues throughout the country and throughout the world. He's attended comprehensive learning retreats uh, in United States, Israel, and other countries. He has led many missions to Israel and is looking forward to his next mission in October of 2018 to share his passion about the Weizmann Institute and the importance of, listen to these words, science for all of humanity. Aren't those great words, especially in today's volatile times that we're living? I'm going to say that again. Those five words deserve repeating. Science for all humanity. Uh, like myself, Richard was a single dad. He brought up two twin daughters. I didn't have twins, thank God. If any of my children were twins, I'd be in trouble. Wonderful children, though. He is a single dad. He has grandchildren. And I don't want to take too much longer on his introduction because, again, what you're going to learn today about what this little institute has done in Israel to help our lives, all of our lives, for the last eight decades is going to astound you. So without further ado, Mr. Richard Enslein, let's bring him up. How are you, sir? Very well, Michael. Yourself? I'm doing great. I hope I didn't oversell you there, but I am so excited to have you on the show and to have our listeners be introduced 
to the Weissman Institute of Science. Um, we're not going to do a call-in show today. We're playing less commercials. Uh, I hope you enjoy tonight because we'd love to have you on again. I mean, I don't know how in an hour we're even going to touch on a fraction of the way the Weissman Institute has helped this planet. Uh, so I'm going to let you take over from here, give us a little history, and, uh, and then pick a subject from stem cells to cancer research to uh, what you were explaining to me a few days ago about erasing a stem cell and bringing it back to its embryonic stage. Just a little bit above this mortgage broker's head there, but I want you to just take this and tell us about the wonderful things that happen in that little institute in Israel. Thank you, Michael. The, uh, the Weizmann Institute was started in 1934, before the formation of the State of Israel. It was originally called the Daniel Seath Institute, and it started by the Seath family from London, England, in memory of their son, Daniel. It was started with one building, with the world-renowned chemist Chaim Weizmann. Today, the Institute is on close to 300 acres. It's over 240 buildings. There are 3,800 people working there every day, scientists who only work in basic science research. That is biology, chemistry, biochemistry, physics, and computer mathematics. Those are the only five faculties that exist at the Weizmann Institute. So it's basic science research. And what basic science really means simply is finding new knowledge, finding out things that we didn't know before. And the secret sauce of this great institute is the fact that the scientists are given their academic freedom to answer the questions that fill their curiosity with. They're allowed to follow their curiosity. They're given the, the best technical, the best equipment. Um, students in their laboratories, the Institute does have a, um, a graduate school, the Feinberg Graduate School, which is accredited by the state of New York. Uh, it offers masters of science degrees, PhD degrees, and postdoctoral degrees. So these students work hand in hand with the primary investigators, we call the PIs. There are 250 PIs at the Institute. There are a thousand research groups looking for answers to questions that no one has been able to find before. So as you were saying in your intro, from this curiosity-driven basic science research, for example, come seven of the top 25 selling drugs in the entire world. Uh, the Weizmann Institute um, licenses the intellectual property, the patents, to, in this case, major pharmaceutical companies who then um, take the, the, the drug to production and they market it around the world. So some of the drugs that you may see on television, Humira, uh, Enbrel, um, come from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Enbrel, you see Phil Mickelson swinging the golf club and he said, yes. oh, my arthritis is gone. Well, this comes from the, the Weizmann Institute and was licensed to them. Um, uh, many years ago, as an example of following the, your curiosity, three scientists were working with polymers trying to induce multiple sclerosis. The scientist Michael Sella, uh, Professor Ruth Arnon, and the late Devorah Teitelbaum accidentally invented Copaxone, which became the frontline treatment for many, many decades, uh, for the last two decades, actually, for multiple sclerosis. It coats the myelin sheath. It's kept hundreds of thousands of people out of wheelchairs. It's amazing. Um, it's given people great quality of life. And it happened because these scientists uh, were given the academic freedom to follow the curiosity to try to answer their question. Um, today, uh, these scientists are still working. You were talking about the age that people are living to now. Um, Professor Sella is over um, um, 90 years old. I won't tell his exact age. <laughs> He's still working. And two years ago, uh, uh, one of his patents became the drug Potraza that treats a type of lung cancer. He's also invented uh, uh, Herbitux. Uh, which is a frontline treatment for colorectal cancer, for head and neck cancer mm -hmm. it's used for. It was licensed uh, to Novartis. 
So just to give you an example, his uh, co-inventor of Copaxone, Professor Ruth Arnon, who as a woman, I won't tell her exact age, but I can tell you, <laughs> Michael, she's over, she's over 80. And uh, she has a new uh, drug that is coming to market. It's in uh, cl clinical trials now, in stage three clinical trials in Europe. And it's a universal flu vaccine where one shot will protect you from all known strains of flu. So, you know, every year we go to the pharmacy, we get a flu shot. And it's and a shot in the dog. Sometimes it protects us and yeah. sometimes it doesn't, depending on which strain of flu is out there. But picture, if you will, that this scientist is still in the laboratory at this age and has uh, uh, what can be a real game changer in, um, in a, a flu vaccine. And as you know, the flu really kills children and elderly people. That's exactly so, the two extremes. It's two extremes. So your comment that people will live longer is exactly correct. I speak to the scientists at the Institute now, and they tell us that our grandchildren will live easily to be 100 and in good health playing tennis and do whatever whatever they want. What, what a staggering thought that is. I mean, for a second, I'll look. I always do. When I'm going to do good news, bad news, I always do the bad news first, and then I come back with the good news because you always end with something good. So, of course, it's staggering to think about living to be 100 with you know health and quality of life. Um, but it also is staggering to think what that is going to do to our economy, insurance premiums, uh, population, places to live. And again, what is the retirement age going to be? I mean, obviously, there is no retirement age in the Weissman Institute. You have people working in their 80s and 90s. Uh, it's just incredible what you're talking about, about this extension of life. I want to ask you something that, you know, because we've had a couple of conversations Thursday and Friday, and if it's too early to talk about this in this forum, that's okay. But you said that the Institute is, uh, you mentioned to me, uh, making strides when it comes to Alzheimer's. And to me, Alzheimer's is just uh, the most hideous, I'm sure it is to many of people, to, to lose your mind like that. And you told me the Institute is making some strides on that? Yes, very much so. Um, there are a number of scientists working uh, on the Alzheimer's question. And one of the things that causes success in the, in the Institute is collaboration is encouraged. And they will take physicists and put them in with um, biochemists and biologists and computer mathematicians, because you have all this big data. Well, how do you decipher it? What do you do with it? Mm -hmm. So one of the secrets of the success is collaboration is encouraged. So there's one scientist, uh, uh, Professor Michal Schwartz, who's come up with her theory of um, immunity. It's been thought for many years by scientists all over the world that because of the blood-brain barrier, our immune cells do not cross this membrane that's in the back of our necks and doesn't uh, allow the immune cells uh, in our bodies to get to the brain. Well, uh, Professor Schwartz has found a way through uh, the cerebrospinal fluid to cross this blood-brain barrier. And she has done clinical trials in mice that have proven in videos and uh, tests that she's done that she can melt the plaque off the brains of aging mice and they regain their memory. And this also now is being, uh, it's gone through stage two clinical trials and they are now putting together in the United States uh, a stage three clinical trial where the government will allow this to be tried on humans. So we expect in the next six to nine months that these types of clinical trials will begin on humans. Um, if her theory holds correct, yes, um, I believe that they will be able to uh, reverse uh, the plaque buildup on our brains. It's amazing. And, um, and that will cause, as you were saying, people to live longer with a better quality of life. The reason why this to so much Alzheimer's today and, uh, and dementia is simply because we're living longer. And as we live longer, our immune systems don't work as well. Mm -hmm. So the scientists are finding around the world and at the Institute, um, they found that in cancer, in immunotherapy, basically with, uh, with blood cancers is where it started, they found a drug that will 
supercharge your immune system to bring it down to the lowest common denominator and to be able to um, identify the cancer cell to our T cells, which don't don't can't find the cancer cell. They don't recognize it like they do a bacteria or a, or a uh, virus. And they they have proven uh, in clinical trials that uh, and Weitzman doesn't have a hospital, so they do this in collaboration in 41 countries around the world. And they've done this at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in, in, uh, in Washington. They've done this at uh, University of Pennsylvania Medical Center in, uh, in Philadelphia, where the doctors have used uh, this theory that Professor Zelig-Eshaw put out in the 1980s, that your T cells can kill cancer. And they've uh, come up with uh, CAR T drugs, Think of the word CAR, C-A-R. Mm -hmm. It stands for chimeric antigen receptors. I use acronyms of to remember the, the, the science. That's what I was going to guess, does, yeah. And what it, what it does is it, um, the drug uh, will attach itself to the cancer cell and signal to the T cells through your protein chains that the cancer cells over here, come over here and kill it. And it attaches itself and they did a clinical trial at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center where they had 29 men. The U.S. government would only allow them to be given this therapy if they had 30 day or less prognosis to live. And three years later, 27 of the 29 men are in total remission. Okay, let me try and dumb this down for myself. This particular drug attaches itself to an infected cell, let's say a cancerous cell, and then basically mocks it so your own T cells can just attack the infected cell, not the other cells? Yes, that's, an over, that's, that's correct. That's an oversimplification of immunotherapy that we're all reading about in the newspapers. But most people don't realize it started in the lab of Zelig Eshar in the 1980s. To give you a little more example about this type of therapy, uh, you might have read in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago that Gilead Pharmaceuticals of California bought Kite Pharmaceuticals for 11 or $12 billion. Uh, Kite's a small pharmaceutical company um, in uh, Israel, and they, want, they were after a Weitzman patent uh, that uh, was for uh, one specific drug, and... Gilead wanted this patent, so they bought they bought Kite for the patent. And what this drug does is it's now a treatment for type B lymphoma. And this comes out of out of uh, Professor uh, Eshar's lab. So let let me go, I have to go backwards for a second just to make sure that I am understanding this. Um, Twenty nine people that had less than thirty days to live were given this experimental drug, and three years later, 27 of the 29 are still with us? That's correct. Okay, so the next logical question, because again, lay people like myself always hear these horror stories. Now that an experiment, a controlled experiment like that is done, how many years, what's the time span before one of us can walk into CVS and get this cure for our mom, our dad, or whoever we need it for one of our loved well, ones. Well, there are a number of hospitals around the country that are doing this. Um, um, uh, I can tell you that uh, a few months ago that the FDA approved a drug called Yescarta, Y-E-S-C-A-R-T-A. And that's the drug that I mentioned treats the type B lymphoma. Um, and... Uh, and for people who haven't responded to other types of, of therapies. So you're seeing now that hospitals all over the world are offering immunotherapy. There are many other labs in the world now that are using this basic science research, these theories that have been proven now to produce other drugs, and they're trying this now with solid tumors, but it's been working on certain types of blood cancers. That's where it, where it started. So it, it is amazing because... Um, I believe, I believe that many of the diseases that we face now uh, will be cured in the next 10 to 20 years. But with, with this, I want to be clear, though, that Professor Eshar started this theory of his, of killer T-cells, in the 1980s. So it took till now 
for it to come to fruition. So it's, um, it's a long game, but it's a winning game. Well, it's a long game, but when you compare it to eternity and how it's going to affect people for the next several thousand years, um, it's an incredible game. Now, you had mentioned something um, about patents, and I know you gave me a figure that also, I shouldn't say a figure, a fact or a factoid um, about the type and the amount of patents that the Institute has done. Just uh, well, expand, the last on, number of expand years, on that. The last, the last number of years, Weizmann Institute scientists have been granted on average of two patents a week. They have over 2,000 active patents in a, in a library of about 7,000 patents. As you know, not every patent becomes a business, right. becomes commercialized. So 2,000 of the patents are active. Um, but this is because uh, the basic premise of the Institute, it's all about the people. It's finding the best people, no matter their, uh, their race, their religion, their creed, they just look for the biggest brains and to give them the equipment and the people that they need to succeed. That's the secret sauce, is to give them the ability to follow their curiosity. It's all about getting the best people to, uh, to work there. Yeah, I was going to save that to the end, but you snuck it into me. Uh, of all the incredible things you and I have talked about in the last three, four days that yeah, I get off the phone and I can't even go back to my normal mortgage stuff for a while, you know, thinking about the uh, the concepts that you bring forward we'll, you know, that we'll, are being we'll come adopted. Back to the, we, we'll come back to this at the end. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll well, I'm going to come back we'll to that quote it. right before we leave because I think you may have uh, come up with a quote that the world should live by. Uh, but we'll come back to that at the end. I know we're probably coming close to our first break, but I haven't got the warning yet. Oh, I was just informed by our producer. Oh, that is such a good news. Uh, we had to talk to our advertisers. Uh, we are not taking call-ins. Usually, um, Richard, this is a call-in show. We didn't want to take any time for questions, and we're only taking one commercial break the entire show. I, I, okay, he wants to go ahead and do it now. So we're going to take one commercial break, and then I have to say it. We're going to boldly go where no institute has gone before. I know my friends and family were waiting for that, so I gave it to them. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Mike Banner, and in addition to being the host of the 62 Who Knew television show, I am also the president of Professional Mortgage Alliance, where our passion is helping seniors entering retirement purchase their dream retirement home without the obligation of a monthly principal and interest payment. Please call me at 727-224-3859 or visit my website at professionalmortgagealliance.com. My name is Ann Rogers and I'm a real estate agent and broker in Pinellas County and have been for over 24 years. Ann Rogers Relocation Resources provides a full array of services to help you or your loved one transition gracefully to a new residence or adult living community. Our first consultation is free and with no obligation. Please visit our website or call to talk to me directly.
Hi, my name is Lisa Marie Kennedy, your real estate expert here in the Sarasota Lakewood Ranch Bradenton area. I spent years developing myself, studying the industry so I can serve you and communicate with you the best way possible in your real estate transaction. My phone number is 941-807-2054 or please visit my website at lisamariekennedy.com. Welcome back everybody to 62 Who Knew. Today we are with Mr. Richard Einstein, Einstein from the Weissman Institute in Israel. We are learning staggering things about what is happening, what is gonna happen to our future. Uh, a comment that was just made that still gives me the chills that our grandchildren, not all of you out there are as old as me, but my grandchildren will be living a healthy and high quality life right up to 100 thanks to things that are happening in this little institute in Israel. So before we get back to pure medical stuff, this is something that I asked you once before, and I've been asking Peter Gelbox for a while. With the depth of the way this institute affects the world, how come everybody, including myself, never heard of it? How come when I say to a doctor in a very large hospital here in Clearwater, have you heard of the Weissman Institute? They go, no. Why? Why is it supposed to be the world's best kept secret? It's a great question, Michael. Um, the Weizmann Institute is a not-for-profit. It, it garners about 20% of its budget now from the uh, government of Israel, which is the lowest of any uh, place of higher education in Israel. Most of the universities get 70 or 80% of their budget from the institute. Uh, but the international board feels that from the philanthropy given to the institute, it should be spent on the equipment. It should be spent on recruiting the best scientists from all over the world. Uh, it should be given to, the philanthropic dollar should be given to the postdoctoral students and PhD students and masters of science students that I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the Weizmann Institute has produced 30% of all of Israel's PhDs, whether it's in, in private industry or in academia. And all of the students who go to the Institute go on a full scholarship. No one pays tuition. If you're accepted into the Weizmann, no one pays tuition. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, if you have the grades, if you have the brains, you get in. Not only do they get a full scholarship, they get living expenses. And not only that, they're not allowed to work. They don't want them flipping hamburgers at night. They want them studying. They want them in the labs. So they also get a living stipend. So the board has decided to answer your question directly, not to advertise, not to put ads in the New York Times or magazines, but rather to take the philanthropic dollars that people like you and me sent to the Institute, that it goes to the scientists, it goes to the equipment, it goes to the students. And that's the... the uh, the mantra that they maintain is how they want to spend their money. That, that's a staggering answer. I mean, imagine uh, if some of the philanthropic uh, organizations in the rest of the world, and many of them very powerful and very great, uh, spent less money on advertising and marketing and more money on the direct problem. It does explain why you have thousands of patents and, and so many cures. But hopefully we can be, when I say we, uh, the 62 who knew community as it grows, and I'm hoping it grows very quickly and very large, uh, can be some sort of a, a message board for you in our own little way. Uh, because the world should know about this. Uh, I don't know why I'm speaking for the world. Uh, I, most people don't think I speak for the world. I don't know. I do, but yeah. Uh, the world should know about this and the great things that are happening there. And, and before we get back to taking a stem cell back to its embryonic stage, uh, there are other institutes like this throughout the country, aren't there? Or throughout the world, yeah. I should say. Yeah. Yes, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I want to give you a statistic that comes from Nature Magazine, published in Nature Magazine this year. They ran a study about scientists of what they published, in which journals they're published, 
how many times the articles are cited by other scientists in the world. And they rated all of the major science institutes in the world. And the Weizmann Institute of Science was rated number six by Nature Magazine in the world, and the only place outside the United States for the top 15. So we have in the United States great places of, of higher education, of uh, innovation. Innovation drives the Israeli economy, but it's also driven the American economy. Yeah. So you have places like MIT and Harvard and Stanford. These are places that are rated in the top three in the world. Um, the top five are in the United States, Weizmann's number six, and the next nine are in the United States. So to me, it's amazing that this little country of eight million people, mm -hmm. um, because of their philosophy, I believe, um, has this incredible rating. Uh, you could take the, the Weizmann Institute and literally put it in the parking lot of the University of Michigan. <laughs> it's tiny by American standards. Right. But yet it's so powerful in what it's given the world. You know, it's just, it's all a frame of thought. And I know it always is perception. When I think of MIT, I think of mathematical geniuses. I think of rocket scientists. Um, I think of learning how to count cards in, uh, in Vegas. Uh, when I think of Harvard, I think of attorneys. Um, I don't think of gene therapy and, and splitting an atom and living to be 100 years old when you talk about those universities. I think we're all kind of um, just indoctrinated into thinking certain things. Uh, but like you yes. said, it's just good. Harvard, Harvard has the schools that you talk about, the great law schools. Uh, the Weizmann Institute, as I said in my open, is only basic science. Mm -hmm. It's only the five faculties. There's no humanities, there's no law school, there's no hospital. It's only scientists at the bench following their curiosity to find new knowledge. Now, Harvard does fantastic work in the, in the basic uh, sciences, and so does MIT. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, actually, incredible work. And one of the, the facts that I want to get across here is that when a scientist, for a scientist to become a, uh, a full professor, a principal investigator, in all the universities around the world, they have to get their postdoctoral degree. Without a postdoctoral, just a PhD, you can't become a full professor. Mm -hmm. And Weizmann, the, the, um, the uh, methodology is that if you do your PhD and your, and, your post, and your master's of science at Weizmann, you must go abroad to do your postdoc. You must go to the United States. You must go to Europe. They don't want inbreeding of ideas. They want you to go to great labs in other countries and mm -hmm. come back with new ideas. But conversely, when you go to the postdoctoral level, 68% of the Weizmann postdocs are from other countries outside of Israel. They come to Israel for the knowledge. They come from China. They come from India. They come from Japan, Denmark, Germany, England, France, Switzerland. They come from all over the world to work with the top scientists in the Weizmann labs. So it's it's a crossbreeding of ideas, um, which brings you to when you walk on campus, um, you see everyone. You see everyone from all over the world. It's amazing. It's, it's just the way, not. It's the way the it's world just, should it's be. Just people think it's Jewish people. No, it's everybody. Everybody. Yeah, I mean, with the names you're mentioning and and being Jewish myself, you know, that is the first thing I thought is this 100% Jewish people, but it's not even close. No, not at all. Um, um, yeah. It's well, a exactly, is, is that, is, is you and I uh, had spoken about uh, the other day. Um, when I walk on campus, I see people um, from all walks of life. I see every color skin. I see every shape of eye. Mm -hmm. I see people from every walk of life, and what they have in common is they're the brightest, the smartest, they have a big brain. And that's all you need to be at the White's Room. That's, that's just the beginning of a, uh, of a new great world and the way the world is supposed to be. I, I assume it's a foregone conclusion um, the Weizmann Institute doesn't have a football team. <laughs> no, there's no football team, there's no sports. Uh, 
What they do have for their young sons. They own football teams, but they, they don't actually play them. <laughs> what they have for the young scientists is even better. Um, they're encouraging, and we're encouraging uh, now, um, the hiring of many new scientists for the next generation of, of principal investigators. And there's two things the Institute is doing uh, that many places around the world is not. One is with women. Israel doesn't have oil under the ground. Now, yes, they found some gas out in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. but the country, and Chaim Weitzman said this in his speech in 1950, he said that we're not going to be able to exist exporting oranges. We're going to have to export knowledge. And they look at women as 50% of the natural resources, women's brains. So when a woman becomes a postdoc, they found that that's when they lose the women in science. The women have to go abroad, as we just discussed. But mm -hmm. by that time, they've served in the Israeli army for two years. They've been to college. They had their masters, their PhDs. They're now they're in their early 30s. They're married and they have children. And they have to go to the husband and say, I have to go to America or to Germany to get my postdoc. And that's where we were losing them in their careers. So what we do is we give the women an extra $40,000 living stipend so they can say to their husbands, let me complete my career. Let me go on. Um, you don't have to worry about getting a job right away. You don't have to worry about getting an apartment and put food on the table. The Weitzman covered it for me. Wow. And now what's happened is a greater percentage of women are going on to be full professors at the Weitzman Institute. And they're now contributing, as I was talking to you about, for instance, in Alzheimer's. It's a woman who came up with the, <laughs> with the theory that, that we came up with. It was Ruth Arnott, a woman who came up with... In her 90s. The, universal flu vaccine idea. So it's, it's paying great dividends and the rest of the world should look at women as 50% of their natural resources. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Not All only, right. Not I, this is, you're going to have to dumb this down for me. You know that, but I have to ask you, we started to have this discussion, you know, again, as a lay person, I think of stem cell research of you know, mostly for spines, but I know that's not true. But again, as a layman, you always talk about, or you hear about, or you get a lot of your medical knowledge from TV programs, which isn't realistic. Um, but you talked about a process in which you take a stem cell from a certain part of somebody's body, bring it back to its embryonic stage. You can correct me if I'm uh, quoting it wrong. And then you're able to pretty much do anything you want with it to help with a myriad of diseases and cures. Can you just expand on what probably just sounded like uh, gibberish? Because I have these things in no. my ears and it sounded no, like in gibberish 2006, to me. In 2006, and this is well published around the world, the Japanese researcher won the Nobel Prize for um, his research in uh, what's called pluripotent stem cells. And the problem with his research was in the Petri dish, the stem cell only live for a short period of time, hours, days. One of the Weizmann researchers um, came up with a method to take your skin cell, to take Michael's skin cell from the back of his hand and erase it to become, as the Japanese uh, scientists did, a, a, uh, a blank slate. It doesn't know what it wants to be. Yet. It's totally neutralized. And they, in the Petri dish, can add certain proteins and, and code the stem cell to be a stomach cell, to be a kidney cell, to be a liver cell, to be a neuron, a cell in your brain. And they found a way to stabilize, he found a way to stabilize it so the cell doesn't die in the first few hours or days of its existence. And, um, this same scientist now, in uh, the last time I spoke with him, um, in Parkinson's disease, in PD, um, in the back of our heads, there's an area in the back of our brains back here, where the scientists around the world know that the neurons are no longer making dopamine. And that's why we get Parkinson's disease. Now, what he's going to go into clinical trials to show is that using new high Renaissance MRIs, uh, new types of MRI so he can be totally accurate where he's going to put the neurons, that he takes the skin cell, erases it, makes it a neuron. Now, 
why your skin cell it's your own dna there's no rejection factor like in transplants when someone gives you a kidney they have right. to give you drugs to prevent uh your your own immune system from killing that organ this won't happen because it's your own dna and then he's going to put this into the back of the brain and they're going to try to make dopamine in your in humans and this clinical trial is probably six, within six months of starting in humans. So um, it took one researcher who publishes, then another researcher who picks up on the work, takes it to another level. It becomes a worldwide thing. But at the Weitzman, they are on the cusp of coming up with this treatment. All right. Are you speaking about taking a molecule in our body and breaking it down even further to the stage of neurons? You're yes. going even further yeah. down? Yes. The great, the great labs around the world are understanding what each cell looks like. You, you hear the term nanotechnology thrown around mm -hmm. greatly. And you're talking about nano meaning really tiny, really, really small. Right. So you're take, talking about taking something and magnifying it a million times. So they have the equipment. They have one-of-a-kind equipment in Israel and in some places around the world. Um, to be able to see this and to be able to work with this. And um, they have the, 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 uh, the talented scientists who know how to do this. They have the physicists, the, the computer mathematicians who work along with them to be able to help them uh, ch change the way they're doing their research. And this is also going to change um, the technology um, for uh, laser research. Your, your, uh, X-ray based uh, radiotherapy uh, uh, cancer treatments are going to come out. There's going to be all types of new things that come from from physics. Uh, there are going to be new computers. There are going to be supercomputers that are called quantum computers that run on atoms and being able to stabilize atoms and splitting atoms. And they're going to run, Michael, on photons. Your computer is going to run on beams of light. That's what a okay, photon is. Okay, now don't is. tease me. Don't tease me on this. Are we going to have a transporter in my lifetime? Am I going to be able to beam over to Israel to see you? Don't tease me. Well, I asked that question to some of the scientists in the <laughs> physics lab, and they said to me, don't laugh about it. We're working on it. Uh, so stay okay. tuned. You know, we'll see. All right. Well, I got the chills now. <laughs> There's no way to get around it. Um, you, you, well, uh, and forgive me for looking at my watch. I'm used to having a break every 15 minutes, and I don't want to interrupt you in the middle of something, but we're still very good on time. I want you to pick, I've asked my favorite subjects, spine injuries, multiple sclerosis, cancer. Um, again, it's just staggering to me what you're doing with stem cells. In our last 10 minutes, you pick a couple of your favorite things or anecdotes or stories, uh, maybe even personal stories, uh, about the Weizmann Institute and what it's meant to you and, uh, and how it's affected your life. Well, I, I'd be happy to do that, but I'd like to, as you said, if I could pick a topic. Yeah, do. Um, so much has been uh, talked about the war on cancer. Um, uh, President Nixon, as I recall, started the war on cancer and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars were poured into to cancer. And we are making strides in it. But cancer is not the number one killer of human beings in the world. Heart disease is. Mm -hmm. Heart attacks kill more people than cancer. And that's a fact. Um, in a recent uh, talk that uh, the Institute's provided of scientists who talk to us also, um, as we're talking on the Internet, um, uh, where they give talks is a seven hour time difference. They give talks with seven o'clock in the evening and it's noon here. Um, a scientist was talking about his research um, in the extracellular matrix of, uh, of molecules. And he found a molecule, um, uh, a protein, if you will, called agrin, A-G-R-I-N. And the scientists know that in babies, uh, that up till a few days of life, a baby's heart can repair itself. And that was the basis of the, of the research. But in humans, when we get a heart attack, we have scar tissue. And that scar tissue never heals. Mm -hmm. And we suffer from 
heart disease after heart attack. And we take lots of medicine. Our hearts never work at 100% as it did before the heart attack. But think of the concept now that they found a molecule that can restore cardiac function and enable the heart muscle to repair itself. To me, this is one of the most amazing things because of the fact that the heart is the number one killer of humans. And this is coming. Stay tuned. I mean, and when you say coming, this is 10 years that, away, that 20 years away? It's, it's hard to tell, but it could be in that range, yes. But the fact that they have the basic science, they know what causes it, they found the molecule. Stay tuned because it's going to be in labs all over the world. Uh, it's been published. What I'm telling you, I'm not letting out a secret. It's in medical journals. Other scientists in the world know about it. Someone's going to figure it out. But it starts with basic research. It starts with asking the question, can I repair the heart? And he found a way. Unbelievable. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think anything the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. And uh, I think as Chaim Weissman said, uh, miracles uh, do happen. You just have to work hard. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite cliches of life is uh, the people that say it can't be done are usually interrupted by those doing it. And there's no doubt the Weizmann Institute is, is an absolute example of that. Still got time left. Anything personal you'd like to say how it's affected you? I know you travel the world uh, representing this. Um, and, and again, I, <laughs> I know you have to dumb it down constantly for people like myself, um, which sometimes I think you might get off the phone and go, God, yeah, how does he do a mortgage with an abacus? Um, but what you're talking about well, is fantasy to many people, but it's reality. It's happening. Well, all of us, all of us have our genealogy and all of us have, uh, when we go to the doctor, the doctor asks us to fill out your history. What did your mother die of? What did your father die of? Um, I myself have had major cancer twice and survived it. Uh, I was with her at 35 years old. I lost Sorry. a 33-year-old life to leukemia. Um, but today, the type of leukemia that she had, and this was solved by, a, it began with Weitzman Science and was finished by a science at the, believe, scientist at the University of, of Washington. There's a drug out now called Glevex, G-L-E-V-E-X or A-X, um, that if you take two pills a day, you can stay in remission with uh, a certain type of leukemia, AML. And uh, had that been available in 1982, my wife would still be alive. It, it was approved by the FDA in 2004. Mm -hmm. So we look, at, we look at what genes do our children carry? What genes do our grandchildren carry? And every one of you, of your listeners, knows exactly what I'm talking about yes. as to what did their parents die of. Think about that when you give your history, they're gonna be able to personalize medicine to treat what, what's wrong with you. There's a new uh, wave of science out there now called CRISPR. I'm not gonna get into explaining what the acronym means, mm -hmm. but think of film editing. Think of taking your genome, which we now know has been sequenced. The United States paid a lot of money to help get that sequenced years ago. Mm -hmm. Think about being able to cut out the bad gene, like it was editing a piece of film. They can do this now under what's called CRISPR. Um, it's being done in labs around the world. Um, the future of medicine is personalized medicine. It's preventing Michael to get sick before he gets sick. Mm -hmm. I believe that women should all be given in our medical system uh, a certain blood test that can can tell to a certain degree if they're gonna get ovarian cancer. It's not covered now by our um, medical system. Most of the insurance companies won't cover the test. You have to ask for it and pay for it. Why? What does it cost to treat a woman from, from being diagnosed with ovarian cancer till she dies? A million, two million? Easy. Or would it be better to diagnose her early, treat her early and prevent her from getting sick? I think personalized medicine that's coming down the pike will prevent us from getting sick, and it's the future to longevity. Well, this might be an unfair question to ask, but insurance companies 
who are not known for their warmth, but are known for their eye on the bottom line, it would make sense for them to approve that test to stop people from being on claim and save the insurance company millions and millions of dollars years later. Where's the logic or um, is there just no well, logic I heard to your, this decision? I heard your show last week and uh, uh, Mr. Goldberg talking about long-term care insurance. How many people are on claim now for Alzheimer's or dementia? Yeah. What if you put money into curing the disease so people aren't on claim? Yeah. What would that save the, the long-term care industry? What would it save the planet? It's just incredible. Well, these are questions that basic questions that I think, uh, I mean, I have to stay away from politics. Yes, But I, I think our politicians on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. re, re, need to re-look at health care. Um, I'm not saying that red or blue is right or wrong. I think they're both wrong. I think they yes. need to re-look at how we treat the person, personalize the health care, yeah. personalize medicine, and come up with the treatment for people before they get sick. Yeah. We're trying to very hard, I'm trying very hard to stay away from uh, any type of political um, well, you know, stance I I on to, here. For what, yeah. for what I do, I have to. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Everybody you talk to is on a different side of a question. But we can all agree that maybe a third view might be the correct view. There's four minutes left. We're going to have to cut out uh, our interview in about a minute and a half, uh, maybe two tops. So we are going to go back to something that was mentioned earlier. In fact, it's been mentioned twice now. Um, but if we could give a message uh, other than the incredible things that I hope our viewers and I hope they share this with as many people as they can. So other than the incredible things happening in Israel at the Weissman Institute and other great institutes around the world, that comment that you made to me a couple of days ago and earlier uh, in the show, that when you walk on the campus, you see people of all colors, of all shapes of eyes, uh, that the only thing that matters in the Weissman Institute is the size of your brain. And um, when you said that to me on Thursday in one of our private conversations, I thought to myself, what a message for the world. Can you imagine if the world operated, if our country operated on, uh, it's irrelevant uh, on the color of your skin or the shape of your eyes. It's just what's in here. And we might even add a little to what's in here. Um, but what a staggering way for the Institute to run. We got about two minutes left. And that's the way they run. Uh, uh, bigotry comes from ignorance. We need more education worldwide. We all need to understand each other, work together, and uh, as Weitzman's tagline is, science for the benefit of humanity. Yes, not science for, for the, good, I'm sorry. For the benefit of humanity. That's where we need to go as a world. If we're going not to blow ourselves up yes. and kill ourselves, we, we need to learn uh, that science is for the benefit of humanity. and. We, we believe that we can achieve peace through science, that people can make peace mm -hmm. rather than governments. Uh, Gene Roddenberry is smiling wherever he is as he said those words. Uh, you can, I mean, it, you know, let's face it, bigotry is based on ignorance. It's amazing how many people uh, don't realize that. And we can go over all the problems of the world from cancer to heart attacks um, to war uh, religious-based problems, but the number one problem in this world, I don't see how anybody could deny it, is bigotry. It's amazing. Uh, I've said for years, and I'm sure I'm one of millions that say it, um, we've come so far technology-wise uh, that we just haven't caught up socially. Uh, the world is still fairly backward socially, but we continue to strive uh, technologically-wise. Uh, it has been such, such a pleasure having you. Uh, I hope you will consider coming back, um, uh, and uh, I, I just thank you. Every time I speak to you, I get off the phone and, and think the world is just going to be a better place. Well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you, Michael. I hope that your uh, viewers enjoyed the show because uh, hope is alive. It's around the corner, and uh, we'll all be better for it. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye for now. Bye-bye.
We have about a minute left. I was wanted to close with this last week, but our session uh, on long-term care with Mark Goldberg was so popular. We had so much response from it. I hope you enjoyed today's um, episode. We have about 20 seconds left. I want to tell you we are making some massive changes to the 62 Who Knew website. Right now, it's really more of a glorified web page. But over the next 30 days, that website is going to be a staggering source for everything we speak about here, uh, every tool that we can. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to next week. Take care.